All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Seattle Budget School, episode seven now. It's It's been a few weeks since we've talked to you last. I'm joined again by my good buddy here, the wordy and nerdy Kevin Schofield. Good morning. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, Great no. to be back. Still nerding out over the budget. <laughs> Glad somebody is. <laughs> All right, so last time when we talked, um, Mayor Durkin had presented her budget to city council. We did a little analysis over the budget and everything else. And then you said that it goes to the city council and you explain that process there before we jump into the city council's budget issues. Why don't you explain how, you know, went from the mayor over to the city council right. and then they, they do their voodoo. Right. The mayor uh, sends her proposed budget over to city council. There were about three days of presentations diving into different parts of it that the city council wanted to hear more about. And then the city council went off for about a week to go kind of figure out what they might want to think about changing about that. And that they, that, that's what they call their issue identification phase. And that ends with the city council staff presenting for about three days on what they heard from all the city council members collectively, as well as some, some of their own analysis for that. So uh, last week we heard three days of presentations on uh, issue identification for the council. And now we're going to do a little bit of wrap up on sort of what we heard from them as kind of a preview of what we're going to see in the next round as they look at really starting to propose some amendments and some, some real changes to what the mayor has proposed. All right. So let's jump right into it. I know one of the first big things, hot button issue is that payroll tax. Payroll tax. Yeah. The mayor uh, proposed taking more of the payroll tax money than the city council you know, had sort of dictated in the past and, and putting that into other things. So the city council, when they pass it, the, the payroll tax, passed a spending plan to go along with that that said exactly how much money can go to what. And you know, one of the provisions in that was that if the general fund revenues for the city are still below 2019 levels because of COVID and because the economy is still faltering, they can kind of top it off with payroll tax funds. And according to that formula, they'd be moving over about $85 million for the 2022 budget. But the mayor proposed moving over about $145 million over, so about $60 million more. And, uh, and using some of the federal ARPA funds to kind of make up for that and some of the things that were in the city council spending plan. Well, Council Member Mosqueda, the budget chair for the city council, is having none of that. She, she made it very clearly clear last week in their in their you know uh, issue identification conversations that she really wants to follow the letter of the spending plan that the council approved on that. So she's going to try to claw back all the. She's going to pass what she calls an omnibus amendment that in all the different places where the mayor put some of that payroll tax revenues that it, that, that it wasn't supposed to be, she's going to try to claw all of that back and redirect it all towards the original intent of the city council. Now, it's not clear that it's going to find other sources, funding sources, for all those things that the mayor funded with that. Maybe, you know, what, it's going to, you know, what, what uh, Mosqueda wants to do is going to free up some of that federal opera funding. So maybe some of that could be used for that. But beyond that, we're just going to have to to see whether there's some holes in it. And as we sort of talk through the rest of the issues, we're going to see some places in particular where Mosqueda wants to pull back some money that th some of them are big ticket items and she might have some challenges in, in, in uh, finding other sources to cover them. Mm. So I'm assuming though as well that, that any council intention for that money would as well be directly aligned to the letter of the law that the council wrote. Not to like a, a pet project or yeah, something. Yeah, you mean are, are the are the other city council members going to try to sort of take some on payroll tax money? Uh, mm -hmm. They could try. You know, any any <laughs> any budget amendment, any budget amendment has to get a majority of the council members to to approve it. So if a said city council member can find other four other council members to go along with, you know, siphoning off some of that money for that, you know, maybe that will go through. But it's pretty clear at this point, Councilmember Mosqueda has said. No, 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 no. I want to follow the letter of the law for a spending plan for the payroll tax. Right. Now, one of the things that you talked about after the mayor presented uh, her budget was around homelessness. Yeah. And uh, there was a considerable amount of money in there to to uh, address homelessness. Now the council has put their issues in there. What's it looking like? Yeah. So, you know, let's remember all, all the eyes are on the regional homeless authority. That, that kicks off, that it's, it's really started to ramp up this year, but starting January 1st, it takes over a lot of the contracts that the city's home, uh, homelessness 
division within human services has been managing for years and years and years, right? Those, those contracts and their management transfers over. Um, the Regional Homeless Authority has said that uh, their first big initiative is gonna be addressing homelessness downtown in Seattle, right? So they're getting a check for $114 million from the city in the, in the mayor's proposed budget, which is actually a little bit more than what under the, the contract that the city signed to create this regional homeless authority that they're required to pay. So they're already giving a bit money, a little bit more money. But the regional homeless authority and its new CEO, Mark Jones, has come back and said that they actually want another $27.6 million. And, and it's really for three things. 19.4 million of that is gonna go, would go to creating a new 150 bed, what they call high acuity homeless shelter. So for the folks we see in the street who are clearly in crisis and need, you know, not, not just a little additional kind of wraparound help to get them moving in the right direction, but really treatment to help them get to a better place. Um, a 150 bed facility to go have a really establish a place for them to go. About a million and a half would be to just start up funds to get it set up. And then $17.9 million a year for operations. It's going to have a doctor, it's going to have nurses, it's going to have a whole bunch of special resources and facilities in that. And, you know, when they talked about this last week, Councilmember Lewis in particular said, you know, he's pretty enthusiastic about this, but just looking at those numbers really calls out how expensive it is to try to help some of the folks that we have who are chronically homeless and really in crisis on our streets, right? And if we wanna be compassionate, the price tag for that, and we do wanna be, we all do wanna be compassionate, but the price tag for that is really, really high. And the second thing that, that the Regional Homeless Authority is asking for is $7.6 million for a new 69 person, what they call peer navigator team, which is getting some people who, who you know, have, have formerly been homeless uh, and you know, have that lived experience to provide assistance to people who are currently homeless to help them get, the, get to the services they need and kind of navigate through the system to get the help that they need. And then the third part is that they're asking for another $600,000 to help with their administrative expenses. And you know, one of the issues this year, because it's really the startup year for them, uh, and you know, Mark Dunnis is only hired really at the beginning of the year, uh, their budget cycle isn't quite synced up with King County and the city of Seattle yet. So, you know, ideally they would have gotten all their budget requests in kind of mid-summer, so it all could have been built into the mayor's um, proposed budget. And they missed the timing a little bit on that because it is the first year and they're starting up all that. So they've made an additional ask for another $600,000. And so the city council is gonna have to look at all those three and say, are these things that we really sort of wanna fund? You know, in addition, you know, the city has this Clean City Initiative, which a lot of that has been Seattle Public Utilities and the Parks Department, SDOT, going on cleaning up uh, where there uh, have been sort of large collections of homeless encampments or RVs, you know, parking on the street where people are living um, to sort of just clean up a lot of the litter and the human waste and some of the other, you know, issues that come along with that. That is funded in 2022 up through August at a cost of a little over $6 million. And the city council is going to look at, well, okay, now do we want to fund that through the end of the year? That would cost another $3.1 million. It's unclear why the mayor only chose to fund it through August, but uh, that's a potential thing. And then the last issue that they really need to think about is kind of a good news, bad news thing. The good news thing, part of it, is that between now and the end of the year, a whole bunch, like hundreds of new units of homeless shelters are going to open up. Right. There's just a lot that's been in the pipeline, tiny home villages, uh, a little bit more hoteling, which, you know, isn't going to last that long, but will be around for a little while longer. And some additional uh, non congregate shelter facilities are going to open up. So between now and the end of the year, there's going to be a much more capacity that's going to come online that will just help free up the pipeline a little bit and get some more uh, folks off the street because they have a place to go. Right now, all the, all the shelters are full but there's essentially nothing in the pipeline for 2022 for additional shelter beyond that. We may see a little bit more tiny home villages if they can source locations. Although, you know, the regional homeless authority and Mark Donas are pretty skeptical about that as is the, a lot of the folks and representatives from the lived experience uh, uh, consortium who have also said, you know, look, we have to be, you know, along some of the things that we've talked about before, is are tiny homes uh, 
really sort of temporary homeless shelter? Or are there people who are going to try to live in those for a long time, right? Or just because our pipeline is so backed up, are people going to end up living in them for, for a long time? And where we really need a lot more homes, a lot more housing for people to you know, move through the shelters and into, is this going to end up being sort of a cheaper alternative th that we you know, end up just keeping a lot of people in instead. And the some folks in the living, lived experience consortium uh, referred them as, you know, they're not homes. Let's stop calling them homes. Let's call them sheds because they're much more like sheds than they are like homes. So uh, there's not, again, there's, there's not a, really a whole lot in the pipeline for 2022. So we're going to see a lot this year before the end of the year. And right now in the plan, not, not a lot. So the council's going to have to look at, do they want to change that at all for next year? Yeah, um, clearly, you know, homelessness uh, a top issue here in yep. in the city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the big issues for me that I'm always talking about is education. I know that um, over the last year we've had an opportunity to talk to Director Chappelle quite a few times over there at Deal Department of Early Education. Education Learning. early learning. Yeah. Um, and with the Seattle Promise program, and there was a lot of investment as well around um, early childhood education and everything else. What's it looking like now? Yeah, so uh, DEAL runs two programs. And that's the majority of their effort. They run the Seattle Preschool Program that you mentioned, and also the Seattle Promise College uh, Scholarship Program. Uh, and both of those, a large part of the funding comes from the Families Education Preschool and Promise levy that was passed a couple of years ago. and. Uh, uh, and the programs have actually been a success at this point. It looks like they, they might at some level become a victim of their own success, right? Because they're both oversubscribed. They're both uh, got more people who want to participate in them than they actually have capacity for right now. So they're looking at potentially funding gaps in the years 2023 through 2026 for the Seattle Preschool Program, maybe three to six million over that time. For Seattle Promise, as much as eight to $12 million. Um, now, sort of on the flip side of that, because during COVID, you know, the preschool program and colleges and everything was, was, were shut down. Um, the, as not all the, the levy funding got spent. So they actually have a, a fund balance right now, a surplus of about 14.4 million that's gone unspent over the last couple of years. Uh, so that raises some interesting questions, right? So, you know, actually in addition to that, for the Seattle Promise program, uh, they there's a lot of folks been looking at that saying, well, how can we improve this program? Right. How could we uh, you know, use maybe some ARPA, ARPA funding, federal ARPA funding that came in to do uh, some new things? They did a racial equity toolkit analysis of the program, and that um, resulted in some additional recommendations for investments they could make to improve the equity of, of that program. And so now they're, they've got some hard questions, right? They've got $14.4 million, and they have to look at how to spend them. Do they spend it on some of these recommendations for short-term, you know, immediate improvements of these programs, right? Some investments and in, you know, equity enhancements and reaching out to some other groups, uh, maybe increasing the amount of money that, that's available uh, to, to folks as part of the scholarships. Or do they say, hey, look, we, we're looking like 2023 and beyond. We're going to have a little bit of a funding gap here. Do we reserve some or all of that $14.4 million? Don't spend it now and make sure that we can be solvent a couple of years from now when we're going to need more of that money. Or do they try to actually identify an additional funding source so that they can do all of these things, right? So they've got some choices between short-term things, between saving up for the long-term needs, or maybe finding ways to do a little bit of both of those. Do you think, how do you, how do you think that the deal is going to fare at the, at the end of this budget process? I think they'll do okay. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm not aware of, of deal having any enemies. And in, 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 it's in tough to be a, a, an opponent of of yeah. early of early education, yeah. education as a whole. And I think that that's one of the things in our city. Um, you know, when you talk about all these things, especially <laughs> around social issues, man, education a lot of times is overlooked. That Seattle Promise, and you know, yeah, I went to a HBCU. Yep. And they have a, a transfer program now. Mm -hmm. So you can go there and you transfer to HBC. So I've always got my eye on deal. 
because I'm always trying to push these young people to take advantage of, of that opportunity there. It's, it's, a, it's a, you know, the Seattle Promise Program is a really, really great program. Seattle Preschool Program is doing just, you know, top notch preschool for, uh, for low income families in the city. And, and there's study after study after study that shows that getting kids in preschool makes all the difference for years and years and years after that. So they're both incredibly important programs. It's great that we have both of them in the city. And, you know, I hope we can find additional funding sources for, to, to really keep those going and continue to scale them up. No, good stuff. We have uh, um, one of the big things that people talked about this last year, community-led public safety. And I know that, at least the way I saw it, is that a lot of different money, maybe from one big pot, I think maybe this uh, initially the 100 million, 100 million, but through different avenues for community-led public safety. What's community blood public safety look like now going into this next budget cycle? Yes, yeah, so we've had really three, you know, big signature programs again that came out of that hundred million dollars, right? We had the participatory budgeting program, we had uh, the equitable communities initiative. There's another thirty. Well, participatory budgeting was thirty million. Equitable communities initiative was another thirty million, and then we had this capacity building RFP. And that was another $10 million that, that the city council added a few, about, I think three more in the middle of the year. So it was running about 13 million, but originally it was about $10 million. So altogether it's about 70 million. A lot of that money hasn't gotten spent this year, right? Um, some of it is getting out the door right now. The capacity building RFP, they're working getting the money out the door right now. The Equitable Communities Initiative, the task force made the recommendations, they ran an RFP, they found you know, organizations they want to fund, and they're working on signing contracts right now. So a bunch of you know, the money for those two is going to go out the door. Participatory budgeting has been a little slower. Uh, the Office for Civil Rights is staffing up their staff right now, and they're hoping in the next month or so to issue an RFP so they can get an outside organization to actually run participatory budgeting um, next year. But they're thinking of their $30, uh, their $30 million dollars probably only going to spend about three million this year so about 27 million dollars is going to go unspent right and so what the mayor proposed is let's carry over that 27 million in next year um, which was you know originally planned to be one-time funding for this but she said we really want to make this an ongoing thing so let's actually identify an additional 30 million dollars for next year from an ongoing funding source so that can sort of you know continue this on Right. So, you know, the first 27 million, you know, they uh, you they, there's, they have some options with that. They could they could fund organizations with some sort of combination of, of those two sources of the from the 57 million dollar pot, understanding that 2023 and beyond, it'll just be 30 million dollars. Right. They could say we need 27 million dollars of one time spends on capital expenses and acquiring interesting properties that could be built on for affordable housing or you know, protected for the community and use 30 million of it for for ongoing spending, because that will be sustainable in the future. But what Councilmember Mosqueda has said is that instead uh, with kind of a focus, but you know, I might even say an over focus on what they tend to call a fiscal cliff. This, you know, it's going to be 50, it would be $57 million in 2022, going down to 30 million in 2023. And nobody wants to set the expectation that there's going to be less money in a future year. She said, well, okay, let's carry over the 27 million and true it up to 30 million. So instead of the mayor's proposed 57 million in 2022, there would only be 30 million. And so similarly for the Equitable Communities Initiative, which is probably going to get more of their $30 million out this year, but probably not all of it carry over what doesn't get spent in 2022 over into next year, and then true that up to $30 million as well, instead of what the mayor proposed, which was carry it over and then give them an additional $30 million. And then for this capacity building RFP, the mayor proposed giving another, 20, uh, another $10 million in addition to the $10 million they have this year and whatever they carry over. So same, same, same thing. And Mosqueda said the same thing again, which is, well, let's true it up. Let's carry over whatever goes unspent this year and true it up to $10 million. So Mosqueda is looking across the street to claw back a lot of money, right? Which would help her in this big omnibus amendment thing that she wants to do so that she can get back yeah, all the payroll this, tax money. And, you know, you can look at this and say, you know, fiscal cliffs are real things and they can be problems, but people are smart too. And they know if, they, if they're if they told up front, like, 
you're going to get $57 million this year, but there's only going to be 30 next year. So don't fund more than $30, $30 million worth of things that are going to carry on, right? That are going to be, that are going to have ongoing needs. People are smart and they get that and they can do the right thing with that. Isn't there supposed to be a sense of urgency around a lot of these funds to be able to impact, yeah. you know, what, yeah. what's happening right now yeah. in, in impacting our communities? Yeah, yeah. So, but I mean, they're hard choices and it's a lot of money. And, you know, it's, you know, just look at the things we talked about with homelessness already. To be fair, you know, there's $19.4 million ask from the regional homeless authority to create, you know, a new high acuity homeless shelter, which would be an incredibly valuable thing to have in the city with another very big dollar, you know, price tag on it. Right. So, you know, I, I understand why Muscat and the other council members might want to try to to claw some of this money back while still, you know, uh, communicating that they value these programs. And 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 these are you know this is the hard part of their job. Everybody wants money, and 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 it's hard. Yeah, I, but uh, this is true. But everybody does want money and and need money. Yep. If we were to hold people to their word, though, it's tough. Yeah, I did. If, Although if, what I'm saying, if we were to hold people to the word, one, the mayor said that she was going to put another hundred million into this budget, mm -hmm. right? And you know, this whole time here, this is kind of what people have been expecting. Is this yep. okay? Yep. What's going to happen? Is this yep. hundred million is going to come? What I hear you saying is that the mayor is like, okay, I want to top up all of these programs. Well, so the mayor has said, let's put $30 more million more into participatory budgeting. Let's put $30 million more into the Equ Equitable Communities Initiative. Let's put $10 million more into capacity building RFP. So there's 70 right there of the 100. So that's a good start. There's a few more places where she's putting in some more money into you know, equity-based programs. So, so she's not way off on mm -hmm. this, but it's really Mosqueda who's the one that's saying, yeah, you know, participatory budgeting, rather than 57, let's make it 30. So when when the participatory budget and all of a sudden become the redhead stepchild of, of the council, because it wasn't too long ago that that was something that the council was really um, more than anything participatory budgeting, more than anything wanting to put investment in and participatory budgeting whenever it comes out is really going to be. My understanding of the process is that's where the, the, the city as a whole is, it comes in and talks about how they envision public safety and rolling out these programs and everything else. And if the end result is public safety, why claw it back? Yeah, I mean, these are these are really good questions. And if I were Mosqueda, and I'm not, but if I were Mosqueda, I think I'd say, I'd say two things. First of all, uh, well, maybe three things. First of all, we you know don't want to set expectations that there's going to be a fiscal cliff, right? Uh, again, I think people are smarter than that, but but you know she is she has said that now. She said that several times last week. Um, I, I think. Uh, she would also say, you know, as far as the first $30 million for participatory budgeting, that was, you know, never promised to be ongoing funding by the city council. It was, pro you know, it was promised as, as one-time funding. And then I think she, additionally she'd say, for most programs that get funded, there isn't actually a guarantee that money gets carried over to the next year, right? That it get to the, the end of the year and money this, goes unspent. And this is true, but this money came from a racial reckoning of, uh, you know what I'm saying? A movement of social justice and everything else to this city had never seen before. Yep. You see what I'm saying? Yep. There, yep. there, there is something that's directly tied now to the to these funds as far as what our city went through and the expectations, the outcomes to better the lives of black people and people of color yep. in this city, which is much different than other programs which are important too, but somebody might have a program that's tied to parks and it gets funded every year and they're yep. doing something yep. this yep. and that. This these dollars right here were very special. They were. And, you know, and if you ask the question, could through a participatory budgeting process, could we spend 50 million dollars? Well, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We could spend 57. Could we spend, you know, more than 30 million dollars through the Equitable Communities Initiative? Well, yes, absolutely. Could we spend more than 10 million dollars on the, you know, capacity building RFP? Well, yeah, absolutely. They were very oversubscribed with the first RFP they did, as as was you know as as was the Equitable Communities Initiative, right? So it's not like you know anybody can argue there's better uses for this money, right? There are really really good uses for that money right in front of us.
So this is, wow. yeah, this is a tough one. We'll see if, we'll see if the council gets, you know, pushback for this. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's a few other things under, you know, public sure. safety we should talk about. One is LEAD. LEAD is this program, uh, you know, to, to divert, uh, at least in its initial incantation, divert uh, low-level offenders, often, you know, minor drug offenses and prostitution over uh, into a system where we can get some wraparound services around those folks and, and, and get them, you know, on a better path. And uh, the city has always been enthusiastic about it, but unwilling to fully fund it, right? So there's $9.2 million in this year's budget for it. The mayor has proposed $6.4 million, which is about what was originally in the 2021 budget. The council put some more in it kind of mid-year. Um, but uh, what LEAD has said is, and, and you know, we, we have to recognize that LEAD, with its current funding of this year, isn't citywide. It isn't scaled enough, up enough to be citywide. So what LEAD has said, you know, based on our request from the council, is it would take $21 million to fund LEAD to the point where it could handle all qualifying referrals into this program citywide, right? And that's been a goal that many people have had in City Hall for a number of years is to try to scale up LEAD to the point where it could really be a citywide program. So the mayor has not proposed funding at $21 million. We'll see if the city council does something with that. And then there are a couple of really interesting um, sort of policy questions about, thing, uh, about things. One is, you know, the, the, uh, this whole question of electronic home monitoring. And this is something that gets used for people who um, are uh, released pretrial right, so that they don't have to sit in jail waiting for the trial. They can, uh, you know, they can sort of be detained at home and, and set an electronic home monitoring program. And also for some folks who are released from prison early so that, you know, be, because being sort of detained at home and being able to work and things like that is better than being locked up in prison for people who can, you know, who can who have that option available to them, right? Um, however, the people who are enrolled in electronic home monitoring programs in either of those cases have to pay for their own participation in that system, right? Which can be very expensive. So there's some money already, about $44,000 uh, $44, um, in the um, Seattle Municipal Court budget to subsidize that for low-income individuals. Um, the mayor has proposed tripling that to about $132 million in that. But, you know, some of the task forces that have looked at this have raised some interesting issues. They said, you know, obviously home monitoring is, is better than incarceration, right? But it's not harm reduction, right? It's still harmful in a lot of ways, right? And and it's still part of an incarceral system that uses the threat of punishment to coerce compliance. And so, you know, the, the task forces and recommendations that the city has received on this and the courts have received on this have said that they should really be pushing harder for, you know, not just moving from sort of imprisonment to home monitoring and putting more money into that, but looking at how we don't imprison people in the, in, the, in the first place, right? What are both upstream and at that moment interventions we can do that are really alternatives? And how do we, how do we let judges have more discretion so they don't have to choose? It, the choice isn't just between incarceration or electronic home monitoring. So that's one. Thing. There's also pre-filing diversion. Many of the same you know, issues ar around that, right? Where, um, the, the mayor's actually proposed about a 41% increase in, in the budget for the law department to do more around pre-filing diversion. Um, but, you know, it, it's still not, um, it, it's still diversion as opposed to, uh, and with some threat of coercion where if you don't comply with the program, you're still going to go to jail, right? So there are issues around that. And then, you know, I think, in some ways, there's, there's really a bigger issue around all this and this larger push that we've seen around looking at, um, you know, 911 calls, right? And how do we, to the extent that a 911 phone call doesn't require an armed police officer to respond, how are we setting up a system where somebody other than a police officer is responding to that? And there's, there's been this 
um, research done by the National Institute for Criminal Justice Reform, what the council calls Nick Jr., um, that showed that at least 11% of the 911 uh, calls that SPD responds to, in the end, really didn't need an armed officer responding to them. So at least 11% of those calls could have a different response in, in return. And a lot of the investments through, you know, capacity building through some of these other initiatives have been directed at spinning up some of the alternatives we need in place. But there is this kind of larger issue still that like nobody has the bigger picture of what is that alternative to 911 response look like, right? What are, what are the pieces of that puzzle, right? We've talked about, you know, there's some categories and the, and the council talked through some of the categories. We know there are some sort of medical health related ones. There's mental health crisis related ones. There's domestic violence and you know, domestic dispute related issues. And there are a couple of other categories too. But so what's a comprehensive set? And, and how much do we need of all of those? And you know, how do they all plug in together? And if, and if there are holes, and, and we discover over time, and I hope we discover over time that there are more categories of 911 calls that can be better handled by someone other than a police officer. I think even the police officers want that, right? Um, how do we find those holes and how do we fill them in? So there's like, there's no comprehensive view of what 911 response should look like. There's nobody in city hall actually articulating what that should be. And so then when we look at these funding, rather than just kind of open up the fire hose and spray money around to a bunch of folks and hope that with, through some magical thinking, the right organizations grow up that we can plug into this with no holes, somebody kind of looking more and saying, well, what are the priorities, right? And are we funding the priorities? And what are the holes? And are we, if, if, there's, if, if there's no one today who's willing to step up and start creating something to fill those holes, does the city have to do it itself? Right? Right. I think that what we saw with HSD put out the RFPs for people to respond to 911 emergencies, that was like one of the few categories that they didn't get any response. And yeah. I think they had like 85 or 90 different um, responses come in, but but nothing yeah. for 911. And, you know, upstream investments are fantastic. They're mm -hmm. super, super important. We absolutely need them. But it, it was a little startling for the Human Services Department to go talk to community-based organizations and have basically all of them say, I don't want to do 911 response. Yeah. Right? right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's what they all told them. Right, they found they didn't find any organizations that want to do 911 response. So, do we need to grow new community-based ones? Do we need new city departments, civilian-based city departments that can do these kinds of things? And they again, they're spending up parts of them. We've got this, you know, new proposal in the mayor's budget for a triage one program, which will, you know, handle another sort of slice of it. But what's the big picture, right? And 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 who who can articulate the big picture first so we know? You know, we know what direction we're going in and we know when we're there. We shall see, my friend. Yeah. Another big issue, probably one of my, I, I want to say one of the biggest, <laughs> they're all big, Seattle Police Department. Seattle Police Department, yeah. Um, the overall, the budget, as we talked about last time, is flat. Uh, and uh, which is a little interesting because they've got about $19 million of salary savings and they transferred about 260 people out. The parking enforcement officers, and the 911 call center are now over uh, in, in other civilian departments. Uh, but there were some other cost of living increases that, that came along with that uh, uh, because you know a lot of the central services from the city, like IT and HR and healthcare and things like that have all gotten more expensive. So um, that turned out to about balance each other out. But with the $19 million of salary savings because of all this extra attrition in, in the city, uh, in, in SPD, um, Chief Diaz said, well, you know, of that 19 million, I, I'd like to keep 17.9 million of it and use that uh, for a variety of different purposes to help me sort of just deal with attrition and some other things. So probably the most controversial of that was about $5 million to invest in a number of, of uh, technology investments. And one that the city council really got kind of wound up around and, and didn't quite understand comes back to this issue of 911 response, right? And, it, you know, again, they got this Nick Jr. report that said at least 11% of the calls um, that that uh, go into the 911 call center 
in the end, really didn't need a, a police officer to respond to them. They could have been handled by someone else. But that's not the same as saying when a 911 call comes in, the dispatcher has the right information to know whether they can dispatch a police officer or a civilian alternative, right? And that's a really, really difficult uh, question. So while the city council is like, hey, 11% of the calls, let's get busy right now. Let's, you know, why we're impatient. Why don't we have this other system set up to take those calls today, right? How fast can we get that running? SPD has come back and said, whoa, whoa, whoa let's, let's slow down because we actually have to figure out whether we can really decide, whether our 911 dispatchers can really decide, you know, accurately tell the difference between the ones that need a police officer and the ones that don't. So they've asked for a bunch of money, which turns out to be sort of in the order of millions of dollars to do a bunch more technology analysis and data analysis and try to figure this out. Both, you know, the question of can, you know, what, what are, do, the, do the dispatchers have enough information to be able to accurately predict this one needs a police officer and this one doesn't. And in the cases where they're wrong, how much harm could that do? If you don't send, if you send a civilian to a call that really required an armed police officer, what are the likelihood that someone's gonna get hurt? Or if you send a police officer to a call that really didn't require one, how likely is it that you're gonna escalate the situation and bad things will happen? So, you know, in either direction. So they wanna do both more analysis to see can they accurately predict this, but also to create something they call a harm index to really understand like what is the outcome when these decisions are made about who to send? And do we feel confident that we can make these decisions and get a better outcome by doing this? And the city council, uh, well, first of all, I'd say SPD didn't explain this well, right? And it is complicated. And you know, as a computer scientist, I know a little bit about sort of the technologies that go into these. And I you know, can tell you a little bit about, you know, the, the methods that exist to do this well. And, and some of the methods exist really, really well. But there is a bunch of data analysis and data collection that goes into doing this. It's, it's hard work and it's real work to, to build out these kinds of systems and do it well. But the city council is pretty skeptical about whether this is a good spend for SPD versus other things that they could that that the city could use that money on even potentially investing in more of these community-based programs as well so so you know that that's a that's a tough question the mayor's budget also restores with an spd about seven million dollars of cuts that happened over the COVID area things from like you know event over time because there weren't any sports events right but now you know not only are most of the regular sports events that we would have seen in 2009 back but we got the kraken as well right so there's more right so spd is saying we're going to need that event over time back travel and training uh spd has said that there are a number of officers who are behind on certifications that they need and so they need to actually send people to you know do some travel and do some training programs to get their their certs back up to where they need to be and then just some money on discretionary purposes on uh, purchases that go along with sort of keeping operations going so the city council is looking hard at all those and we'll see sort of how much of that to go along with there's also, you know, the community service officer program, which, you know, is already funded at 18 people. At the moment, they have 10 vacancies, so they're working really hard at filling. They expect in very short order. They've got people in the pipeline for all 10 of those positions. So they're hoping in very short order they're going to have that filled. But the mayor's budget adds another six positions to that. It costs about $1.3 million. That everybody really seems to like the CSO program. You know, it's a great way to send, you know, uh, SPD employees who don't have a gun and a badge out to handle a lot of issues. They can take police reports, they can, you know, intercede in sort of community issues that are going on. So people like the program a lot since it's been revived. But the question really for the council is, should it remain in, in SPD or maybe be spun out to the community, the, the community safety and communication center or, you know, somewhere else, probably the CSCC. And the city council, would, I think would really like to see it move out of SPD, but the CSOs are really adamant that they want to stay in SPD. So th there's a bit of an impasse there and the city council is balked at moving them out against their will, but that's, that's coming up again. And then finally, and this is gonna be a pretty controversial one, Chief Diaz has asked for $1.1 million to create a hiring bonus program for both new recruits and lateral hires 
within SPD to help them meet their pretty aggressive goal this year for hiring new SPD officers into the department to deal with, you know, start to address the high attrition. And um, Council Member Herbold in particular has come back and said, you know, look, SPD isn't the only department that's got a bunch of vacancies right now, right? Do any other departments have hiring bonus programs? And, you know, if we look at doing hiring incentives and hiring bonuses, shouldn't we be doing that citywide as opposed to just for SPD? And Councilmember Peterson came back and said, yeah, you know, those are good questions, but also has any other department had the kind of crazy attrition that SPD has had over the last two years, right? And the answer to that is probably no. So there, this council is kind of wrestling with both sides of that a little bit right now. So those are really the big issues for SPD. All right. I see, <clears throat> excuse me, I know they're going to continue to get addressed here through this budget process. Yep. We're up against the clock, Kevin. I got one more slide here, and that's yeah, yeah. what's up next. Yeah. So uh, this week, now that they have their issue discussions, the city council is starting to actually write amendments for, uh, uh, for the mayor's budget. They're working with their staff and working with each other to make sure that there isn't a lot of redundancy in that. And next week, they're going to roll out all those proposed amendments, and they're going to have another three days where they walk through kind of department by department and area by area and discuss all of those, uh, all those proposed amendments. They won't be voting on it next week. The voting doesn't come until towards the end of November. But they're going to start voting on that. And then the, the, uh, the budget chair, Councilmember Mosqueda, is going to take all of those and what she heard from individual council members is which ones have a lot of uh, support, which ones don't. And she's going to build her first balancing package that takes the ones that really have consensus support and put it together into a set that still balances the budget because legally they have to do that, but, you know, are, are hopefully uncontroversial. Wow. Is the city going to get the budget it deserves? Yeah, I think one way or the other. We're going <laughs> to get, like get, get the deserve. budget that we need? I don't know. Are we <laughs> going to get the budget we deserve? We're definitely going to get the one we deserve. We're definitely going to get the one we deserve. All right, Kevin Schofield, man, appreciate you taking the time. Appreciate um, you. Thanks, yeah, for, thanks, it, for, thanks for nerding out with me. No, I mean, this is this is good stuff. You know, the thing is, people have to, they have to take this into their own hands. You know, and yep. I mean, it's good to be able to give tools because not everybody can just take something in their own hands. They don't understand. Yep. That's why budget school is important. And we're going to stay on this throughout the process. right? Yep. Yep. And we got there's another um, public hearing coming up on November 10th. But you don't have to wait for them. You can email and call yeah, your council know. members and let them know how you feel about this. All right. Good stuff. OK, everybody, um, on behalf of my buddy here, Kevin Schofield, we're going to get out of here. We'll catch you soon for episode number eight of Seattle Budget School.